inviting me. Um, as Dr. Love said, if you don't ask questions yourself, I will try and ask questions myself to you. Uh, this is not only about me talking here and presenting my ideas, this is about having a discussion. This is about you getting as much information as I will also try and get from you. Um, I've already mentioned this to some of you in the smaller sessions that we've had before today, but I really want to make this a dialogue. And as such, I really ask you to ask questions. You can interrupt me. There will be a Q&A at the end. But if you feel something just in the middle, if there's something that you don't understand, if there's something that you want to know more, please make sure you just interrupt me because the idea is that we all, at the end of the session, can have some very important things that we can learn from each other as well. Um, you can clearly see what the headline or the title of my talk today will be, Journalism in Times of Fake News. We will go into the actual details of that in a second, but I would like to start by discussing with you this. What is it? What do you see? A pair of shorts. Buried under sand. Yes. Shorts buried under sand. Why do you think this is, or it could be, an important picture? It's a clue. Of it's what? Of something larger. This was actually one of the, this was the first day of one of the most important trips that I've done as a journalist. This was back in 2014. This was not far away from the Rio Grande, so the river that divides Mexico and the United States. And I was there to cover a story that in the summer of 2014 was particularly important, namely thousands and thousands of children and teenagers just like you had decided to leave three Central American countries, El Salvador, Guatemala and Honduras, to flee on their own to the United States. And all along the river, that this was on the US side, you could see this. So you could see everything that children had left behind in trying to move from these countries to the United States. I just took a photo of that, I took many other photos as well, of everything that they left behind as they moved on in their journey. And it struck me back then as a very powerful symbol of what we do as journalists, what we cover, and one of the stories that I then followed was the story of this young girl. Um, you can see that she's crying there. I was interviewing her for the Spanish service of the BBC. Her name is Aide. She, back then she was 18, so now she must be about 22. And she crossed the whole of Central America, pregnant, so eight months pregnant. And as soon as she crossed the river, she gave birth to her son Cesar, which you can't see in the picture, but she's holding Cesar in her arms. And I accompanied her when she arrived in the United States through the process where she was taken into a, a specific house or home by the church where they treated her well, where they gave her a place to shower, where they gave her some clothes, and where they helped her to move on to the next step of her journey, which was another 52 hours on a bus until she finally got to some of her relatives in the northern part of the United States. Um, as you can imagine, this is a very powerful story that got a lot of interest also from not only my editors, but from the people who read this story in South and Central America, but also in English when, I, when we did it in English. Um, there were very big challenges for us as journalists covering this. As you can imagine, it is not very easy interviewing someone that age, and we only accepted to do this and to interview her because in her country she was already um, an adult, so very over age, over 18. Otherwise, we wouldn't have been allowed to do it, and we wouldn't have done it anyway. But this, we used this story out of many stories that we did to actually illustrate why this is a very big phenomenon, but also why it is important for us to work as journalists and to, to do the things we do. One of the things that we did afterwards, immediately afterwards, was this. Does anyone recognize that person on the right? Oh, the right. Can I guess? Please. Prime Minister of Israel? No. No. Why would it be Israel? He looks similar to, um, I forgot his name. Netanyahu? Yeah. No, in this particular case, there was a president of Guatemala. Okay. So we went to the border, we reported on the people who were actually crossing, and then what we did afterwards is we tried to speak to the people in power and try and get answers from them as to why they're allowing this to happen. Mm -hmm. This is one of the key elements of any journalistic work, trying to hold powers accountable of their actions and decisions. That's, by the way, the interview that I did with the president of Guatemala and then for the BBC. And all that story was months covering that, uh, all in all. So the whole 
summer of 2014, led me to understand that these here, these five elements, are absolutely vital, a vital part of working as an international journalist for an international organization. Not only from my perspective, my perspective, but from your perspective as well. So not only from the perspective of the reporter doing the job, it's also from the perspective of those who are watching the news or those who are, who are reading the paper or listening to the radio. So the first element is to explain realities responsibly. What do you think responsibly means? Ethically. What does ethically mean? Knowing the difference between right and wrong and that knowing that what you are explaining is true. Um, trying to not be biased. Yes, so that's one important element. So trying to do it fairly and accurately. So basically making sure that it's based on facts. Keep that word in mind because it's going to be important later on when we talk about fake news. Also doing it in a responsible, fair, balanced way. So making sure that you get all possible voices involved. That if you're talking about children fleeing, if possible, you get the voices of those children whenever possible, you get the voices of their parents, you also get the voices of the governments, as we did just there. The second element, to hold powers and authorities accountable, as you just saw, trying to interview authorities as much as possible. Why do you think it's important to interview people in power? Because what? they're the ones who like, make decisions. Yes, so them. essentially they make decisions that affect you in your daily lives or in that case, affect these people who are leaving their own countries. To be a bridge between societies. So if you pay attention to what I was saying, then I was reporting this, and it involved three Central American countries, the United States, and the audiences that read, in that case, my article, or who watched my videos, who were all across Latin America, but also in the English-speaking world. So it is basically a way to explain a reality in one particular country or in a series of countries to people in a very different set of realities. And I highlighted this because this is something that will directly affect you as well and that I'm sure that you can learn a lot about because all of you, I think, just as I am, you heard it from the introduction, are international by nature. If you're not bilingual or trilingual, if you're not bicultural or tricultural, simply here you have the chance to talk and to encounter and to meet people from many different nationalities and that actually will help you in whatever you, whatever you do afterwards. You don't have to be a journalist to try and be a bridge between societies. I will talk about that in a second because my own past and my own biography has really been one of the biggest assets when it comes to reporting the news and to making sure that I can do exactly that. The fourth one is to provide context. So what is context? It's background stories. Background. Yes. Any other idea? what? Knowledge. Yes. So basically explaining why. <coughs> so if you have the story of, in that case it was 60,000 miners trying to get to the United States unaccompanied, the goal that I have as a reporter on the ground is to be able to say, why is that happening? And why is this important to someone here reading the newspaper or watching the news? And the fifth element is to serve as a forum for public debate. Why? Why do you think it's important to have a public debate on these issues? Maybe so something can actually be done about the issue? Yes. Yes. Essentially, that's, that's the answer. So, I can't change decisions that are made as a, by politicians. I am not a politician myself. But I, what I can do as a journalist is present the information that, in a way, will lead those politicians to realize that there's a very big problem and they have to make decisions to change it. So, these are five elements that I ask you to keep in mind when we're talking about, about journalism, because if I had to say what my profession is in just three words, I would say this. So journalists are translators. There are cultural translators, there are political translators. And I like this because I come from a family of translators. So my parents are translators. They put me in a German school because they understood the value of learning different languages, learning different languages from scratch. And just as they do translating of documents or they do interpreting or they try and bridge those differences between languages. I believe that I'm doing the same but in a different context. I am bridging realities and trying to translate one reality to people who are watching or reading that reality in a different context. So again, when you think about your own context, and there's someone here who has already fallen asleep. Sorry. 
please don't fall asleep. Um, when you're trying to bridge those realities and when you're trying to understand those differences, try and understand your own cultural background as an asset, as something that you can really gain from, as something that you can really learn from and use in whatever you choose afterwards. And that has to do with, again, the way I was brought up and where I grew up. Has anyone been to Bogota? You come from there? No. <laughs> okay. Well, that is the capital city of, of Colombia, where I grew up. It's a very big city, nine million people. And I went there to a German school, as we already said, where I had the privilege of literally being every day trilingual. Back then for me, it was sometimes a problem. I felt a bit strange sort of being in between those different cultures and feeling that my family was not necessarily like all the other families around me. But with time, and especially as I chose the career path that I chose, I realized that that was an asset. And that coming from that background and understanding the possibility of really being that bridge between cultures and societies is something that we can actually learn from a lot. And I would really take that as a key message to you as well as you advance in your, in your respective paths. And that leads me to this. So when I started studying, I know it's a bit cryptic, but I like sort of cryptic images. Um, when I started studying journalism in South America, the world I was in was a very different one. Actually, Dr. Love was telling me earlier that when I started, when I started my career as a journalist, the iPhone hadn't been, even been invented. Um, I was not aware of that, but yes, the iPhone wasn't invented. So the world that I started in as a journalist was a very different world to the world we live in today. And also the world I have to report on today. So when you look at, at this puzzle, when you look at what is important as a journalist today, the world has certainly changed. There are many, many challenges that we face nowadays as journalists. Everything from gender balance to AI to fake news, obviously. And fake news is one of the elements that I would like to focus on. There are two challenges in particular that I feel are absolutely vital for journalists today. One of them being fake news, the second one being the relationship between journalists and politicians. And that's something that I'd like to discuss in a bit more detail. Has anyone seen this picture? Yeah. Uh, what is striking about that picture? The grandma over there doesn't film the parade or something, but yes. the others are filming the whole thing. Everyone else <laughs> is doing something that one person isn't. The old lady. Yes. Do we all see the old lady? Yeah. So there is a big divide. I mean, this is, this is a parade. As you say, this is one image that I found extremely powerful because it encompasses it really summarizes very well the way people deal with technology and the way people communicate nowadays. So whereas the old lady was probably just enjoying the parade without the need to take a photo or to publish it on Instagram or to make a six second video or to publish a post on Facebook or to do something on Vine or to take, do something on TikTok, everyone else was probably busy trying to take a photo of whatever was happening there. And for us journalists, this happens to be a very big challenge. How do we communicate the stories nowadays when most people actually use their mobile phones? How did your parents um, get the news? Or how do they still get the news? TV, newspapers. Sorry? Their phones. Their phones. <laughs> Not all parents. Um, but for example, my parents would sit every night, they would watch one news program, and they would have one or two newspapers that they would uh, subscribe to, and those were actually the sources where they got their information. That is a very controlled way of getting information. And also back then, a very reliable way of getting information. Because you really believe that the one paper or the two papers that you subscribe to were, were newspapers that would do their work responsibly. Again, going back to the first point that I mentioned. Nowadays, you don't need to sit down in front of a television to get the information the information comes to you. And there are studies, for example, about news consumption, especially in your, your age, where basically everyone gets their information on the mobile phone. What is the first thing that you do when you wake up? Check the phone. Check the phone. What is the first thing you do when you check the phone? What do you check? Do you check an app or do you check the color? Instagram. Sorry? What? The what? 
the what? Alarm. Alarm. Yeah, well, but after the alarm. <laughs> BBC News. <laughs> really? BBC News? A <laughs> subsidy. Well, you're rather an exception because most people, and in particular in your age group, do tend to go first thing in the morning when they wake up after they put the alarm off um, to their favorite social media platforms where they do not necessarily get news, but they can also get news. So that's one thing that was very important of a recent study about young consumption of news. And by the way, there are many uh, news organizations that are now trying to change the target, they're trying to change the people they want to reach to include, for example, teenagers. So whereas before, in Germany, for example, there's a radio, a very important radio channel which and it has a slogan that it's only for, for adults, even though it just presents news. There are other organizations that have really changed their focus to say, we want to target people from 14 to 44. Why do you think 14 to 44? Because maybe if you target people who are 44, 14 already, they're going to be an avid user of that company. Yes. And so they, as they will grow up, they're going to keep using that company. That's brand loyalty. Yes. Basically, that's one of the key elements behind that. If you try and make sure that you get young people interested in your product when they are 14 or 15, that will increase the way they deal with news afterwards in their adult life. 44 is a random, nu a random number, it doesn't necessarily mean anything with 44. But what it does mean is that all the generations, it is also difficult for them to change their habits of consumption when it comes to news. So someone who is 75 will probably not download TikTok to see if there's any way a news organization is going to publish things on TikTok. By the way, news organizations are also developing strategies on TikTok. So it's not something that I'm just inventing. So there is a generational divide and a way in which we journalists have to present the news to both older generations and younger generations in a way that people can recognize the news brand. Because if I ask you now where you get your news from, I'm pretty sure that most of you would say the social media platform first. Mm -hmm. So you would not necessarily say, I get my news from the Wall Street Journal. You would probably say, I get my news on Facebook, and on Facebook it is the Wall Street Journal. And that makes a difference because whereas our parents or our grandparents had a direct link to a specific media brand, which they knew they could trust, in the times that we're living, that is becoming more difficult to get. So I don't know how many of you have actually read all sorts of stories on Facebook or I think you have Facebook on Instagram and you can recognize immediately where it comes from. Mm. And then say, yes, I read this story that comes from the New York Times. So this is one of the main challenges that we have as journalists. We haven't actually sorted it out completely because there are all the time different ways in which the news is developing. I can tell you that because when I started as a journalist, there weren't journalists who would only really 24 hours work as social media journalists. And now that is something that we all have to do. So I sometimes am also the social media manager of Deutsche Welle when I'm working there, and I'm trying to understand how people react and how people communicate with us. By the way, social media is also being used more actively by politicians. Does anyone know at least one politician who uses <laughs> social media? Yes. And that leads me to the second point. But before, just this. So whereas before, which is something that I think, whereas before you had traditional media that was more important to people uh, listening or watching TV or radio or print, now news is shifting towards a different platform and you find news on Instagram, Snapchat, Facebook and so on. Why do you think I chose Google up there? Although Google is not, in, in a sense, the, it's the social media platform. Instagram, you Google it. Sorry? If you see news on Instagram, you're going to Google it. That's yes, in a way, yes. But it also because of the way the news works now. Mm -hmm. Has anyone heard of the three letters SEO? Mm -hmm. SEO. Search engine yes. optimization. Someone up there said it? Yes, search engine optimization. So basically, when you work in a news organization and you write articles, you have. You normally have one headline that you write which is very accurate, 
but your goal has to be to produce a headline which uses some of the keywords that people would use when they search on Google for that term. So there are specific words that when you or when I go to Google, you search. For example, if, if you want, you're interested in Germany, then there are certain things that you would always or often go and search for. And my goal when I'm writing the story is trying to incorporate some of those words to make sure that my story is more well, it's easier to find on Google and thus that more people have access to it. So that's why I included Google in this because there are really people in every news organization working not only on producing stuff for Instagram, Snapchat or Facebook but also in dealing with Google and how they can use the power of Google to make sure that people actually get to the news more easily and also in bigger numbers. And the second challenge is this. I'm sorry it's a bit dark. Does anyone know what that is? White yeah. Press conference. Press conference. So no, it's the, uh, when the president Yes. So you're all right. So it, it's A, the White House. How do you recognize the White House? Because of the flag and the White House sign in the back. B, press conference. Yes. And there's something which I find particularly striking, and that's the fact that it's empty. Mm -hmm. um, before, when I was working in the White House, or well, when he's reporting on the White House, um, you would have these kinds of conferences very regularly. So three, four times a week, you would also have conferences in different, uh, in different departments. So for example, you would go to the Pentagon, or you would go to the uh, Secretary of State, who was giving a, an interview of some sort, or a briefing, and you would obviously be entitled, if you had the press pass uh, from the White House, to go to the press briefings. When do you think was the last press briefing? Um, in the US? Yes, when was the last briefing, press briefing there? Like during the, the Iran conflict? During the what? The Iran conflict, maybe? No. 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 Probably no. A year, 10 years ago? No, no, 10 years ago, not because I was there. <laughs> Three years ago. The 11th of March, 2019. So it's nearly a year since Trump's press secretary appeared there before the press to answer questions. Does anyone know, by the way, who Trump's press secretary is? No. No, what's the name? <laughs> <laughs> Stephanie Grisham. Um, it is telling that people do not necessarily know who Trump's press secretary is, because in the United States, everyone used to know who the respective press secretaries were. Why? Because you saw them on television nearly every day. This has changed, specifically with the Trump administration, but also in other countries, the way that journalists deal with politicians. There is always a tension between journalism and politics. Always. And there will always be. Why? Maybe politicians don't like t the fact that the truth comes out at times. Yes. Because it's a bad reputation on them, on their government, on their administration. Yes, so politicians want to control what type of information goes out. Journalists feel the duty to make sure that whatever is in the public interest gets out as quickly as possible and as fairly and accurately as possible. So there's always that tension between politicians and journalists. But this is a completely different scenario because even though you had that tension in the past, you would still have these press conferences where you could ask questions and you would sometimes get the answers that you were looking for. It works, by the way, very different in Germany where I uh, work now as a correspondent. Because one key element here is who do you think has control over who enters the White House? The White House. So basically if the White House doesn't like you as a correspondent, they can say sorry, but we don't want to in our press briefings. Something that, by the way, has happened before with the CNN correspondent Jim Acosta, something that, by the way, is happening today with the NPR correspondent that was planning to go on a trip with Mike Pompeo and who was banned because of a colleague's interview that the, that the government didn't like. So this just shows you how tense the situation has become between politicians and journalists, in particular when you have this story. What is fake news? They're not real. Okay, but what would be real news then? Real news is occurrences that actually happened, fake news, 
are news that actually doesn't happen. Yes, and what else? Bias news. Yes. What else? Evidence. Why evidence? No, it would be like real news. Yes, evidence would be real news. You have the evidence to show that it actually happened. Mm -hmm. Fake news is a term that's very old. It is not a new term. You have had fake news stories for a very long time. Something that changed the way fake news has an impact on our lives has to do with the first challenge that I presented. The fact that people now get their information on their mobile phones mm -hmm. and that it can spread very quickly and very easily on social media platforms. So you can have a tweet that is published and then in just a very short time you can have thousands and thousands and thousands of people commenting on, on this. Fake news is news that, as you said, is not real, that is deliberately spread, and that is deliberately spread to mislead. But it's also a term that has been politically used by the US administration and by other politicians to present something different. So how many tweets do you think Donald Trump has published since he became president? How many? How many days has it How many? 100,000? No, no, that would be 2 million. 50,000? No. How many zero? Because it's not 700. 700? Yeah. No, that's probably something that does in about two months. He's published over 11,000 tweets since he became president. Half of those tweets, about 5,800, have been an attack against someone or against an organization. About a thousand of them have been attacking media outlets, and many of them have been tweets criticizing what he says is fake news. Now, what would be what, according to Donald Trump, is fake news? Yeah. Anything that he anything doesn't say. Him, yeah. Yes, so basically anything that is not in favor of how he reports, of how he uh, presides over the country. So it's not necessarily something that is misleading, probably his view it is, but it's not something that is not based on facts, it's something that goes against the way he's governing the country. So that's why, for example, other governments like the UK government and the UK parliament, also the parliament in Australia, have passed legislation to ask people, and especially politicians, not to use the term fake news. What term do you think they could use instead? Unreliable news. Keep going. Biased. Keep going. Bad source. Disinformation. There's a difference between misinformation and disinformation. Let's stick to disinformation because it's what most, in a very close way, resembles what we've just described as fake news. So this is a term that everyone has now heard, that everyone is now discussing, that it is becoming a very big problem in our societies because I am sure that many of you, when you open your phones, when you go through your social media, when you go and have a look at news, you ask yourself, how do I know if this is true? Mm -hmm. How can I make sure that this information that I'm reading is actually based on facts? Has anyone come across a fake news story? Probably. Yeah. 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 Can someone give me an example, please? Well, we don't know if it's fake or not. Yes, how you do. In some cases, you, you do. Oh, the Houthi drones. Um, all those stories about the world ending. For example. Like, yeah. How do you know it's fake? No, like, you remember back in like 2012, there was yeah. a whole thing where the world was going to end in December. 12th of November. Yeah. yeah. Or November, whatever. Any and other then, case? Well, yes. I think this was last year. There were definitely drones that hit Saudi Arabia, but they actually they weren't real. Yes. Oh, has anyone heard any cases, for example, of fake news now with the coronavirus? Yes. <laughs> Basically, whenever there is a very big story, and whenever that story has a human impact, so it's something that can create an emotion, it is very easy to get plenty of fake news, so plenty of stories that are disinforming the public. Terror attacks, for example. Something happens, and immediately you have all sorts of different theories. Mm -hmm. A virus, like the one we're discussing now, that creates fear among the population, that creates a lot of questions, a lot of doubts, and it's precisely because of these doubts that these kinds of stories tend to be very successful on social media. There's one case that I spoke earlier about in one of my uh, sessions, smaller <coughs> sessions, about, about a hurricane in Florida in, I think it was 2016, 
and there was a news, out news outlet that presented it as the first Category 6 hurricane mm -hmm. in history. What do you think is strange about that headline? Doesn't it not exist, a Category 6? Yes, there's no Category 6, it only goes from 1 to 5. <laughs> um, so it's impossible to have a Category 6 hurricane because the category is... Well, there, there is no Category 6 hurricane. But just imagine, if you're in Florida, if you have a family and a house, if you live not far away from the sea, and then all of a sudden you hear that there's a Category 6 hurricane coming and you don't know that Category 6 hurricanes don't exist, what will you do? Panic. Panic. One. Second, you would share it with everyone you know, asking those people to also move, to also leave. And that is where fake news becomes very, very problematic. If you want afterwards, we can discuss in greater detail what you can do to protect yourselves against fake news. That's a bit of a longer a longer story, but in essence, that's something that we have to work as journalists, but that we're also asking all the time our readers, viewers, listeners, to make sure that they protect themselves as well. You have a question? Yes. Does anything happen after someone sends fake news? Like, is there a consequence after? Yes. So if, it's, if, it's, if you can confirm that it didn't happen and it violated, for example, let's say the shortest, the smallest point would be if it violates the code of conduct of a certain media outlet, then you would probably be blocked. If it's something very, if it's something illegal, then that could lead to a whole process. By the way, I don't know if you saw this story a few months ago, I think it was, of a town in Macedonia called Venice. Has anyone heard this story? I don't know the full story, but I heard something about it. What did you hear? Which um, must be. God, like, I can't remember. You told us, I'll probably say something. Well, it's basically some people who found out in Macedonia, in this small town, that by producing fake news stories that would very quickly become viral, they could get a lot of money. So they left their jobs and they started producing fake news stories non-stop as a business. How do they get money? How do you think this works like that? How, do, how can someone... Yes. Basically, those clicks are tied to ads on social media and then the social media platform gets money obviously and the people who publish it as well on their sites get money because so many people are clicking on it. Yeah, they do that a lot, like not only in Macedonia, but like in a lot, in a lot of countries in the Balkans. They yes, in the Balkans they do that yeah. quite a lot. But I know specifically from the case of, of this town in Macedonia um, and when you actually interview them, they were, I didn't go myself, but there were journalists going there and asking them, they said, well, that's a way in which we can earn much more than if we just worked in our local bakery or if I went to a local school or if I did anything. It is a very easy way to get a lot of money. The main stories that they were tackling back then, that they were producing stories about, was what do you think? No, no. US politics. <laughs> so they were actually publishing all sorts of things about the 2016 election and people were just clicking furiously at these stories and they were getting a lot of money back in Macedonia. You can see the extent of the challenge. So this is not something that just some random person in, I don't know where, decided to publish a story. It is becoming a problem of, very, of a very big nature. And it's something that everyone has to deal with. Governments are also dealing with that as well. So, and that goes from passing legislation to educating people to working hand in hand with news organizations and with different outlets. There are all sorts of measures that are being taken to deal with the challenges of fake news. And again, just to summarize, this is fake news. Mm -hmm. So deliberately creating a spread, an intention to deceive, it is presented as real news. So at first sight, you wouldn't necessarily know that that's not accurate or true. And it's often distributed on social media. One of the main fake news stories of 2016 was a story about the Pope endorsing Donald Trump. If you saw it, you would, you, you would really not know at first glance that it's fake. Why would this story be strange? Where would a red flag appear if you saw a story about the Pope endorsing Donald Trump? Perhaps Donald Trump is not Catholic? No, 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 it's because religion like religious is neutral. Yes. 
Excellent, that's it. So normally, you don't have a Pope or any religious authority endorsing a particular candidate in the United States for president. That story, that fake news story, even had what it claimed to be a statement by the Pope, by the Pope saying why he endorsed Donald Trump instead of Hillary Clinton. Now, why do you think someone would create that story? Because they want Donald Trump to win. Among who? Catholic. There you go. So, Donald Trump was back then, still is, very popular among religious people. And one way in which they thought they could get the attention of Catholics in the United States was by presenting the story whereby the Pope endorses Donald Trump as US President instead of Hillary Clinton. Again, this just to show the magnitude of the problem. And this is one of the 1,500 or 1,500 or whatever tweets that Donald Trump has done attacking the media. So the fake news, again, the term that he used, failing New York Times, NBC News, ABC, CBS, and CNN, is not my enemy, it's the enemy of the American people. What consequences do you think such a statement would have if among the base that follows Donald Trump you now have the impression that the media is the enemy of the American people? They would only listen to him rather than other outlets? Or yes. Fox News. Yes, that's it. So basically among those who follow him fervently, um, you would tend to say, why would I go to those media outlets if they're the enemy of the American people? Mm -hmm. Media outlets in general, they make many mistakes. I'm not here to say that journalists are absolutely, um, they never make mistakes. But one thing that we can say for certain about journalism is that it's a key element of a democracy. It's an absolutely vital element of any democracy because it essentially gives you and your parents and your relatives the capacity to choose and to make decisions. Whether you vote for the Green Party for the left party, or for the centre party, whether you don't vote at all, because in many countries that's also a right, whether you make a specific case or you take a specific decision in your own local community, all those types of decisions are decisions that you can make because in one way or another you have been informed or misinformed. So again, even though you can criticise the media, and I would also encourage you to criticize the media if you have the elements to do so. Try and understand that, a media, that, that, that the media is an absolutely vital element of our democracy, enshrined in many um, constitutions as well, and it is something that I firmly believe a journalist has to be protected as much as it can. So that's why I find such a statement uh, rather problematic. You may dislike the New York Times, you may dislike CNN, CBS, ABC, NBC, but that they play a role, you can't deny it. And then we come to another story that I covered, and that's a story that I want to end on before we lead to some questions. This was in 2017. It was already mentioned in the introduction. Um, I work for Deutsche Welle, and one of my roles there is to be the breaking news correspondent when it comes to security, when it comes to terror threats and terror attacks. So basically, whenever there's the possibility of a terror attack, whenever something happens that you think could be a terror attack, they send me either to Barcelona when it happened, either wherever it happened, or they put me in the studio to try and analyze it. And one of the big stories that I covered was that. Does anyone remember the attack in Barcelona in 2017? Yeah. What happened? There was a truck. A truck? Yes. Yeah, and? Yes. You can also use the active form, basically saying that someone took a truck and drove it into the crowd in La Rambla, which is Barcelona's main thoroughfare. Yeah. It killed, if I'm not mistaken, 13 people and it injured many, many others in what was by then a pattern in various European cities, including where I live, including in Berlin, but also, for example, in Nice, where they would simply hijack a truck or a lorry and simply drive it into, into a crowd of people. The same happened in 2016, the 19th of December in Berlin, where it killed 12 people and injured more than 70. Not another story that, by the way, I had to cover. You can imagine that for a journalist, being there, having a look at those makeshift memorials, trying to speak to the people affected, trying to get the information from the authorities to confirm or deny what actually happened, 
must be one of the most challenging stories to cover and also something very, very difficult emotionally. You're dealing with a human tragedy and one that affects not only those who were killed or injured, but that affected a whole city and I would also say a whole country. So I think this also shows, just as I presented you the story at the beginning with uh, Aide and her newborn baby, this also shows why journalism in these kinds of situations is particularly relevant because it can help distinguish between what is actually confirmed and what is not confirmed. It can help distinguish between what is a fact and what is a rumor. And that is something that I tried to do while I was in, in Barcelona. And this is actually a quote that was taken on me back then, sorry, this one, which I think shows you in a way how things are developing. Because that was the very first time that I was broadcasting from my iPhone. Um, you would tend to think that journalists are still using very big cameras and are using, have got a big team around them. Basically, the way things are developing is that you do it with your own iPhone. And you can connect live and you can be live any means. Basically, I put a program on my iPhone there and if I wanted to, I could go live now. And this just shows you that the, the way technology has changed not only affects how you get the news, but also how we produce the news and how quickly we can get to a place to report what is happening. And that was certainly the case in Barcelona with that story. And just as in the other different situations as well, I tried to follow the same five guidelines of trying to present context, trying to bridge differences between societies, trying to hold politicians accountable, trying to get answers from authorities, trying to make sure that I could provide context and try and inform people responsibly. And I'd like to end again with, with that photo because I think it is particularly relevant to what we're speaking. And I'd like to just share five thoughts which, come, which are important for you. So first, think about what news you consume, whatever you consume. And I'm not talking only about politics. If you happen to like fashion or if you love football, think about what sources you're looking at. Think about what type of news you're getting and how, how you're getting it and where you're getting it from. So try and be an active consumer of news, not just opening your phone, scrolling, scrolling down, and then, oh, I got some sort of news. Try to be more active when it comes to the news you get. Use different sources for the same story, especially if you doubt, especially if you're not sure whether something is accurate or not. Try and find it in a different place and see if they report it the same way. In journalism, there's something called the two-way principle or two-source principle which basically means that I cannot publish anything unless I can find it in two sources that are verified independently. I know it's a difficult exercise for you to do as well, but if you have the time, and especially if you doubt, try and find the story somewhere else. Ask people around you and discuss an easy way in which you can try and find out whether a story is fake is by asking people around you. You have a very big community here, and many people would be able to tell you, for example, that no religious organization would endorse a candidate for president in the United States. So if you doubt, ask. The fourth one, be curious, but also be careful. So go beyond your expectations, try and go beyond your comfort zone, but at the same time, be careful of what you do. Be conscious of where you're going. And the fifth one, again, leave your comfort zone. And specifically, when it comes to be curious and also be careful, has anyone seen this photo? <laughs> has it, well, you spoiled it. But has anyone not seen the picture? If you just publish that, that could be very controversial. And I, I don't think I have to explain why. If you see this from a different perspective, <laughs> that's what he's doing. So there you have the two, and with that, I'd like to end basically on the message, be careful of what news you consume. Be curious, but be careful. Thank you very much. Okay, we're going to open up the floor to questions, and I just want to tell you that after about 10 minutes, we're going to finish this up, but if you're interested to talk to Mr. Sparrow further, and I, of course, encourage you to indulge your curiosity. He has incredible experience in journalism. 
We will be going over to Casa Fleming, and you're welcome to come, come on over with us to ask further questions. If you do that and you're a boarder, please let your dorm parent know that you're going over to Casa Fleming. So we'll expect that you'll be doing that. But for now, I'm just going to turn this over to you here. Okay, you have a question. Um, yeah, so I've read or watched something recently that um, basically said that there is, you're able now to take AI or something and make someone, like put someone else's face on someone that said something? Yes. Um, how do you think that that's going to affect the media world? And do you think that's a danger? Has anyone else seen? Yeah. No. Do we know what a deep fake is? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, no. Yeah. no? So uh, basically you have fake news, which is a photo or text, which has been altered in a way that it looks like real news, but it's just fake news. So it's not a real story. The way it is changing now is by doing it with video. Um, so you could get anyone now. like saying something like, yes. like, oh, we're going to drop a nuclear bomb. Exactly. And that's really mm -hmm. dangerous. If you have the time, we haven't got the time to do it now, but you can just, I guess you all know the song <coughs> Imagine by John Lennon. Mm -hmm. But if you just go to Imagine by John Lennon, sang by world leaders, you will get an example of what I mean. So you have all these world leaders singing Imagine, where you obviously realize that they're not singing Imagine, but the way the eyebrows move or the mouth moves, you would not guess unless you know that, it's, that they're not seeing it. In any case, this is becoming sort of the next, the next challenge that authorities, and not only authorities but media outlets as well, are facing when it comes to fake news. Because one thing is debunking a fake news story in print. Another thing very different, because it affects how we perceive reality, is when you see someone actually saying something that in reality he or she didn't say. It can be used in many ways. So in fact there are universities developing <coughs> deep fakes in, as a way to try and debunk deep fakes. Because there's a way of understanding that if you know how it's done, you can easily then reverse the process and understand how you can fight it. So it can be used in a positive way as well. But it is a very big risk because what can now, what is now simply maybe a, a game that some people use where you stand in front of a screen, and I've seen it, and you say something, and what happens on the screen is Leonardo DiCaprio saying what you said. What, sound, what might sound like a game has a very, very um, problematic aspect to it, namely what you said yourself, that it can lead to someone allegedly saying something like, okay, we declare war on country X, Y, or Z, when in reality, that didn't happen. So that is sort of the new frontier of the fight against fake news. You mentioned that there's always been a lot of tension between journalists and politicians. And like the question I'm going to ask, like, I don't know if it's like, I mean, it's specifically to you. Have you ever had cases, because you said like politicians to try to like, sort of like control what's, what's out there and what shouldn't be out there? Like, have you had have cases on your own where a politician has tried in any sort of way to manipulate manipulate any sort of information that you've had to, in a way that they didn't want it out there? That happens all the time. I mean, there's this discussion all the time, yeah. and that's why it's important to set the rules at the beginning. Mm -hmm. So when you interview a politician, when you sit with that politician, it needs to be clear from the start, for example, are we speaking on the record? So can I quote everything that you're saying in this interview? Or are there elements <coughs> that you want to have on background? So for example, I can use the information but not cite you. Or completely off the record, I can't even mention it. That has to be clear from the start. Mm -hmm. It also has to be clear from the start what happens afterwards. Mm -hmm. Because there are many politicians, and I experienced that many times in the United States, also in Germany, where they say, hmm, I'll give you the interview, but I'd like to see it before you print it. And that is a no-go. So in, in, at least in the media outlets where I work, that is absolutely forbidden. You cannot accept an interview with a politician or with basically anyone who then has to check what, um, what you wrote, what, what he said. And in fact, there was a case not long ago where the Chinese ambassador was interviewed by a paper and in the end he wanted to basically get rid of half of the interview and it turned into such a big problem that the newspaper in the end published the whole thing, explaining exactly what parts the ambassador had tried to block. 
which led again to an even bigger discussion as to whether the media outlet was entitled to do exactly that and what the actual rules had been at the beginning of the interview. Basically, in order to keep this very concrete, you need to establish the rules at the beginning. And in my particular case, and for the news organizations that I've worked, once you set those rules, once the interview is recorded, it's up to the journalist and up to the media outlet to broadcast it, and the politician cannot sort of change it or, or alter it in any way. If he doesn't like it, he could afterwards publish a statement saying I completely disagree. Mm -hmm. But the interview is done based on those rules. What if you're so passionate about, about like a certain issue that you want to dig in so much into it using like ways that might not be like ethically correct? No. no? Um, normally you wouldn't do that, but you have to understand that the key goal in journalism is to produce stories that are of human interest. Mm -hmm. So if you and your team and the whole organization wants to get something out because they believe that it is in the public's interest to know, you could try and find ways to get that information out as long as it's not illegal. Mm -hmm. Because you must understand that journalists, just like anyone else, are citizens bound to rules and regulations that need to respect the law. So I am not above the law. I need to respect the law just like anyone else. So there is a discussion in journalism as to what might be of public interest and why not be of public interest. And you can discuss how far you go to present a story if you believe it's in the public interest. I would tend to be very careful if there is any hint that the method used to present that story might not be in accordance to the laws of the world of regulation of the country. We have time for one more question here. Who? John. 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 So, uh, I have over here. Here, here. Right. Yes, go ahead. Okay. So, I was going to ask, do you uh, like state your opinion on your writings or uh, should journalists like uh, create a platform <laughs> for you based on stuff? Yes like, and no. It's just stating facts and not, not opinion. There are different types of journalists. So, if anyone here has read something from a news agency, like AP, AFP, Reuters, DPA, F, and so on, they would normally tend to present the basic facts. So the five questions, who, when, what, where, when. So that's really just the absolute basic information that you need to be a journalist and to produce more information. Then you have a variety of other types of journalists. You have those, for example, who are only writing op-eds. Does anyone know what an op-ed is? Mm. So an open editorial. Basically a column. So what you see in a newspaper as, a, as an opinion column. There you're entitled to write your opinion because it's absolutely clear that what you're writing is opinion. You're not writing it as a fact. You're not presenting it as something that is absolutely true, truthful and valid. On the other hand, in my case, for example, as a TV journalist, I am not there to give my opinion. I am not there to say what I think about Salvini when I'm covering the Italian um, elections or the European elections in Italy. And that's not my job. My job is to report on what he is doing and how he is presenting his different proposals. So I would really say I am not there to give my opinions. Um, I've tried to be as clear and as fair and accurate as possible when presenting the news. But at the same time, it is clear that there are other platforms where journalists can present their views in a personal way as an open editor. Thank you. Can we give a final major round of applause?